All right, Ninja Nerds, in this video, we're gonna talk about fertilization. So if you remember, if you watched our ejaculation video, we got to that point of where the sperm has been actually ejaculated from the actual male genital tract, right? And depending upon if copulation is occurring, so copulation is just basically the intercourse, right? So sexual intercourse between the actual female and male. If the sperm is actually going to be ejaculated and placed into the actual female genital tract, then we have to follow this sperm all the way to the egg. Well, before we start talking about sperm, what, where is that egg actually located? Well, if you look here, here's the actual fallopian tube, right? And then this is the, called the ampulla of the fallopian tube, and this is the fimbria of the fallopian tubes. If you remember, you had the graphene follicle, right? And that graphene follicle was actually popping out. It was undergoing ovulation due to luteinizing hormone and popping out this secondary oocyte, which was freezed in metaphase two, right? So it has the secondary oocyte, a zonopellucidal membrane, and then outside of that, it had those granulosa cells. So those granulosa cells, which are part of the corona radiata, right? And it's basically going to be sitting in the ampulla, waiting for the sperm cell to come and fertilize it. So the seminal vesicles are one of the actual uh, seminal glands that we discussed, right? So seminal vesicles was one. So let's talk about that one first. It's actually accounting for about 60 to 70 percent of that seminal fluid that we discussed, right? About 60 to 70 percent. It's also making a lot of other chemicals that are present within there. One of the really big ones is fructose. Fructose is extremely important. Reason why is it provides an actual carbohydrate source of fuel for that sperm cell. Another really important one is actually called prostaglandin. So prostaglandins are another really, really important one. And then another thing that also is very, very important in here is another enzyme called coagulase. There's a lot of different chemicals that we could talk about in, but I'm mentioning these ones because these are some very, very important ones that we're gonna discuss, okay? So that's the seminal vesicles. And again, he's accounting for about 60 to 70% of that seminal fluid. Now, seminal fluid is important because it provides the transport medium for the sperm cells, and it also can provide a lot of nutrients and activating chemicals. The other one that we said I was gonna, I said I was gonna mention is the prostate gland. So the prostate gland accounts for about 30%. So on average about 30 to maybe a little bit around 40, but in general about 30% of that seminal fluid. It can make a lot of chemicals that are also very important. One of the big one is it actually provides uh, citrate. Citrate also can be used as a energy source, okay, as a keto acid intermediate. It actually produces a chemical, very, very important chemical called fibrinolysin. And it's a really, really interesting one. I'll mention this one. And it can produce a lot of other chemicals. One of them that's actually kind of clinically significant is prostate-specific antigen. And it's actually a good uh, marker to determine if someone might have uh, what's called BPA, benign uh, prostatic hyperplasia, okay? Or BPH, actually, you call it. BPH. So this is a good indicator of BPH, uh, benign prostatic hyperplasia. Okay, so prostate-specific antigen, citrate, fibrinolysin, a lot of different chemicals are produced here. Now, let's actually talk quickly about sperm, like the structure of sperm, and then we're gonna follow this guy through. So if I look at a sperm cell here, let's say I actually zoom in on a specific sperm cell here, and I, I actually talk about a couple of structures because it's actually important that I talk about it. Here's the head of the sperm, right? And in the head of the sperm, you actually have the nucleus. Okay, this is the nucleus, it's gonna have 23 chromosomes, right? It's also gonna have a really important structure that we're gonna talk about, and it's gonna be this green structure, and this is called the acrosome. And the acrosome consists of a lot of different types of hydrolytic enzymes, like acrosin and proteases. Another thing is right here, this is actually gonna be called the midpiece, and the midpiece is actually made up of a lot of mitochondria. So these mitochondria are literally formed in like these little coiled manner, and this is gonna be consisting of a lot of mitochondria, and that's the midpiece. The last part is the tail, and that's actually gonna have flagella. It's basically made up of flagellin, right? So you're gonna have this other part here, which is gonna be flagella. This last part here is actually gonna be flagella. If I were to kind of just quickly zoom in on the structure of flagella, it actually has a lot of different things that actually make it up. It actually forms what's called a nine plus two arrangement. So you have these microtubules that are arranged in like pairs of nine. All right, I'm not gonna draw all of them here. 
but then in the middle it has two of them, right? So this is actually one that's going to make up a good portion of the actual flagella. And a lot of proteins in between here are going to be a lot of dynines and other different types of motor proteins that are important in basically helping to move the flagella, right? And there's a basal body at the end, which is a 9 plus 0 in the triplet form. Okay, but that's what's making up the flagella, the tail. So the tail is responsible for the, the actual movement, the locomotive move, movement, movement. The mitochondria is responsible for taking some of those nutrient sources and making ATP to help to power the flagella. Okay? Now, the sperm cell gets ejaculated into the female reproductive tract, right? Why did I mention some of these enzymes? Well, fructose is important because it provides an energy source for the mitochondria to process and produce ATP for it to move. Prostaglandins are really, really important. Let's say I draw here prostaglandins. Look what prostaglandins does. Look what this son of a gun does. He comes over here and he acts on the smooth muscle of the uterus. He comes over here and he acts on the smooth muscle of the uterus. Guess what he does? He tells the uterus to do. He tells the uterus to start contracting, but it does it in a weird way. It actually causes it to contract backwards. So it's called retropulsion. So what it does is it actually helps to suck and squeeze the sperm cells up into the actual female reproductive tract. It's a beautiful design, right? Another thing, you know how I mentioned this enzyme called coagulase? Whenever the sperms are actually ejaculated, it can easily drain out of the vagina. So what has to happen is, a part of the seminal fluid, there's this coagulase enzyme. It's actually called vesiculase. And what vesiculase does is it coagulates a lot of the testicular and vaginal fluid. And it basically allows for this actual sperm cells to latch on to the walls of the vagina. It literally is going to latch on. So now this is actually going to coagulate a lot of these chemicals. It's going to coagulate a lot of the actual seminal fluid and vaginal fluid and cause these sperm cells to latch on. What happens to all the other sperm cells that didn't latch on? They get lost out in from the vagina, right? So they're lost. Then, remember I told you I mentioned pro fibrinolysin? Fibrinolysin helps to be able to break up some of that coagulation and then allow for these actual sperm cells to be released from that. So there's an enzyme that helps to be able to cause them to coagulate and latch onto the walls of the vagina, and that's called vesiculase. And then there's an enzyme called fibrinolysin, which helps to break up some of that coagulation and help to release them into the actual movement form. So now it's moving, okay? Another really cool thing about this sperm is that it has other different types of chemicals. Well, another, one of the chemicals is actually called relaxin. It's also in the seminal fluid. And relaxin also helps to be able to help with that motility action. So it, it helps to speed up the motility. And another really important chemical is called seminoplasmin. And seminoplasmin is basically like an antibiotic chemical that destroys a lot of the bacterial cells and, and other different types of microbes that are present within the female genital tract. Okay, the sperm cell is actually moving here. And it's actually moving through this alkaline fluid. And you know whenever sperm is in acidic, it moves slow. When it's in alkaline environments, it moves really fast. So it moves through this alkaline environment pretty, pretty fast. And look what it does. The sperm cell is going to get ready to start fertilizing that egg. In order for us to actually see what's happening, we have to zoom in on that, OK? So now what we're going to do is we're going to zoom in on that. And we're actually going to take a deeper look at that. So over here, I'm basically drawing here an enlarged view of the oocyte. So this is that secondary oocyte that's frozen in metaphase two, right? And it has, so this is actually the cell membrane of the oocyte. This uh, red structure is the zona pellucida. These black proteins here are called zona pellucida three binding proteins. And these are those granulosa cells that are part of the corona radiata. And then here's our sperm. So here's our sperm. Okay, and again, what do we have here? We had the head right here, right? Oh, another important thing is, you know, you should be careful whenever you're taking, like, you're drinking a lot of alcohol or people who are actually deficient in uh, selenium or exposed to lead or radiation, stuff like that. It's actually weird. What can happen is if you're exposed to pesticides or lead or lack of selenium or even alcohol, look what's going to happen. You're going to form some freak sperm. You can get double-headed sperm, multiple-headed sperm. So just stay away from that crap, okay? All right, now, anyway, sperm's going to come here, but it has to do something first. So the first event that the sperm has to uh, go through is what's called capacitation. So what's the first event called? It's called capacitation. Capacitation. Now this is occurring as it's moving th generally throughout the entire female reproductive tract. Actually, if you remember, estrogen is produced around uh, you know, days 1 through 14, right? 
Estrogen actually causes the cervical glands and some, even some of the uterine glands to produce different types of uh, you know, uterine fluid and cervical fluid that basically helps to perform this capacitation reaction. So what's capacitation? You know on the head of the sperm, it has a lot of different, uh, different types of proteins. So let's say here in this red I have a glycoprotein. And let's say uh, not only do I have a lot of glycoproteins here, but I also have a lot of cholesterol. I'll draw that here in green. Let's say here this green is cholesterol. And I have a lot of other different types of molecules here. So let's say I have cholesterol, uh, different types of protein molecules, and stuff like that. What I need to do is I need to get rid of a lot of this stuff. I don't want a lot of this stuff here. So what capacitation is, is it's basically cleaning off the head of the sperm. So now look what happens after it undergoes capacitation. So it undergoes this capacitation reaction, and now look at it. It's only going to have specifically modified glycoproteins left over. So it's going to have these modified glycoproteins. But if you noticed, none of those other proteins are there. None of that cholesterol is there. We cleaned it off. That event right there is called capacitation. So we cleaned the head of the sperm. Now, the next thing that's going to happen is the sperm is actually going to start migrating and moving towards the actual zona pellucida. Now there's a lot of chemicals in, in that these granulosa cells are producing, like hyaluronic acid. Now what happens is when that sperm gets capacitated, not only does it clean the head of the sperm, but another thing it also does is it helps the sperm to be very, very motile. So it actually in it induces what's called hypermotility. So it also causes capacitation not only cleans the head, cleans head of sperm by removing proteins and modifying glycoproteins, removing cholesterol, but it also increases motility of the sperm. They call it hypermotility. And now look what it's going to do. It's going to beat through that hyaluronidase and all that, all that hyaluronic acid and move towards the zona pellucida. Where is it going to bind? So now the sperm cell has a specific site that it can actually bind to. So let's, what is this guy right there called? This little guy right there, that black protein, is actually called zona pellucida type 3 protein. So it's called ZP3 receptors. The sperm has specific proteins that can actually recognize that ZP3 receptor. So now look, the sperm cell actually interacts perfectly with that. So there's this nucleus, and then here in green we have that important structure that I mentioned, which is the acrosome. Once the actual sperm cell binds onto the ZP3 receptors, what happens is something really weird. This membrane opens up, the sperm cell's uh, membrane, the top part of the head. It opens up, and then what happens is the vesicle of that acrosome fuses. And what it starts doing is it starts releasing all the chemicals out of that acrosome. So it starts releasing a lot of different chemicals. What could those chemicals be? It could start releasing what's called acrosin. It could start releasing other chemicals like uh, proteases. So different types of protein digestive enzymes. And what are those enzymes going to start doing? They're going to start burrowing a hole through the zona pellucida. So now it's going to start burrowing a hole through that zona pellucida. So now we're actually moving through that zona pellucida. Okay, so we're burrowing some holes in that zona pellucida. And what is this called? Whenever the sperm binds with the ZP3 proteins, its acrosome fuses and starts releasing a lot of acrosin and proteases. Okay, this is actually called the acrosomal reaction. You know what actually triggers this, this chemical release? It's actually this. Let's say I had the ZP3 receptor here. Let's so actually say here's the head. Specifically what's happening is once this binds onto the ZP3 protein, calcium ions start running in here. When the calcium ions start rushing in here, that's what triggers this actual acrosome to fuse with the membrane and start releasing these chemicals. Okay? So this, is, this whole event right here, where the sperm cell binds to the ZP3 proteins and releases these hydrolytic enzymes, this is the second reaction. And this is called the acrosomal reaction. Okay, so first step is capacitation, clean your head, increase your motility. Second step is the acrosomal reaction where you bind with the ZP3, and then calcium rushes in, activates the acrosome, and releases acrosin and proteases that digest and burrow holes through the zona pellucida. Now look, the sperm can come in and bind to these proteins here. So now there's proteins on the actual cell membrane of the oocyte. What happens is, let's say we draw that sperm cell right here. Okay, so here's the sperm cell. Let's actually erase this granulosa cell here. We don't need this granulosa cell. Okay, so we're going to put this proteases there. So now what happens is the sperm cell has a specific protein on its actual membrane. Let's say it's right like this. 
like that, okay? And we're gonna call that protein right there, it's actually called a beta unit of a protein. So it's like the beta part of a specific protein. There's another protein over here, but it's not gonna interact just yet. It's not interacting just yet. This is the alpha part of the protein. Once the beta part interacts with these proteins on the oocyte membrane, something very special happens again. It opens up specific channels on the cell membrane, okay? So it opens up these specific channels on the cell membrane. And what opens up, what triggers this opening of the channels? It's whenever the sperm, the membrane of the sperm, specific proteins on the sperm, bind onto the oocyte membrane. Once it does that, opens up special channels. And look who starts flowing in, sodium ions. Sodium ions start flowing into the cell. Why is this happening? Because you know there's not just one sperm trying to penetrate this egg. There's thousands upon millions of sperm trying to penetrate this egg. You know that whenever a male ejaculates, a normal average is about two to five mils, unless you're some type of freak. Within that one mil, one mil of ejaculate, it can contain up to 50 to 130 milliliters, I'm sorry, 150 to 130 million sperm. So if you produce five mils, you could produce potentially up to about 500 million sperm. So there's not just one sperm cell that's doing this, there's thousands upon millions of sperm cells doing this. And then what happens? So like once, let's say that there's another sperm cell that's doing the same thing. He's also, he bound to that ZP3 receptor and he's burrowing a hole right now also. So he's moving through this also. But this sperm cell was the first sperm cell to touch the oocyte membrane. This one was the second one. As this guy's getting ready to come and bind onto the membrane, the sodium ions are flowing in because this guy touched the membrane. When the sodium ions flow in, it creates a positive charge across the actual membrane. And what that does is that blocks this actual sperm cell from binding. So now the sperm cell can no longer bind to the actual cell membrane. It's inhibited, it's hindered from that activity. This event where sodium ions flow in and actually trigger this electrical membrane potential across this, which inhibits the sperm from binding, this is actually called a fast block to polyspermy. All polyspermy means is just multiple sperm trying to fertilize this one egg. Okay, so it prevents us, it pro provides a fast block. That's the third event, okay? So the first it was the capacitation, second was acrosomal, third is the fast block to polyspermy, and that's caused when the sperm touches the oocyte membrane with its beta subunit, sodium ions flow in and inhibit all the other sperm cells from attaching. Then, once it does that, then the alpha subunit binds onto this. So now look, now this alpha subunit binds on to that actual protein there. And then this cell membrane, the oocyte cell membrane, and the sperm cell membrane fuse. And when it fuses, look what happens now. It can release its nuclear material out into the oocyte cytoplasm, right? So now it's actually released out here into the egg, right? To the ovum. So now it's actually draw here. Let's say this is actually going to be our haploid sperm cell, right? So he's got 23 chromosomes, okay? 23 chromosomes here. So there's our actual, so let's actually draw it like this too. So this is actually the male gamete, right? He's pushed in. One more thing has to happen because we don't want another sperm cell like being able to get in at all. We don't want any sperm cells trying to be able to get in. So we have to do one more block. Once this sperm cell moves in, it triggers a specific action in a specific organelle in this cell. You see this right here? This is actually going to be called the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. I'm just gonna put smooth ER. Once this actual nucleus gets pushed in, this pronucleus gets pushed in, okay, for the sperm cell, this smooth ER is activated and it starts blasting out calcium. So now calcium ions are gonna be produced. These calcium ions, what they do is they do something very special. You see these like black vesicles here with these scissors? You see what these like little scissor enzymes are? These little scissor ions, enzymes are a component of this vesicle. This is called a lysosome. So this is actually a lysosome. This right here is a lysosome. This one right here is a lysosome. And vice versa, this is also a lysosome. Now, what calcium does is, is he helps to be able to activate these lysosomes. So now look, it's gonna activate this lysosome. This is gonna activate this lysosome. And this is gonna activate this lysosome. What are these lysosomes gonna do now? They're gonna start migrating to the actual cortical part of this egg cell. So now look, this lysosome is gonna come up here and it's gonna fuse with the cell membrane. So now look, all of these lysosomes start fusing. Let's draw one right here. 
Let's draw one right here, fusion here, and let's draw one right here. So now look, this starts actually joining here, this fuses here, this fuses here, and this fuses here. And it releases those little scissor enzymes. Remember those scissor enzymes, right? Those scissor enzymes that we actually mentioned? Those are your hydrolytic enzymes. Those hydrolytic enzymes, guess what they're gonna freaking do? They're gonna start breaking down a lot of areas. So they're actually, what they're gonna start doing is they're gonna start degrading the zona pellucida and breaking down some of the zona pellucida proteins. So this one out here, it'll degrade the zona pellucida protein and de degrade some of the actual zona pellucida in general. And it'll actually harden this cell membrane here. When that happens, now the sperm cells don't even have anything to attach to. So what has it done? Calcium's activated these lysosomes to release lysosomal enzymes out, degrade a lot of the zona pellucida proteins, specifically the ZP3 binding proteins, and all the other proteins that are making up the zona pellucida, and even hardens the actual cell membrane. This event here is called the slow block to polyspermy. And this is the fourth and final action, right? And then look what happens. Love, right? This gamete right here, what happens is once this calcium, oh, you know what else the calcium does? It also does something else really special. Look at this calcium. It also tells this secondary oocyte that's in metaphase two, finish meiosis two. So hurry up and finish meiosis two. When this secondary oocyte finishes up meiosis two, look what happens here. So it stimulates this actual uh, secondary oocyte to kind of finish up metaphase two. And then when it finishes up, it undergoes meiosis two. What does meiosis two produce from this one secondary oocyte? It now produces this new fertilized ovum. So now we're gonna have this new, this new actual oocyte, this fertilized ovum point right here. So now let's actually draw this guy here. This is actually gonna be haploid. And this is gonna be, we're gonna say this is our definitive, so D, definitive ovum. The other point here of the meiosis tube, besides forming the definitive ovum, is we're gonna form what's called a polar body. And then that polar body will actually just get degraded by enzymes inside of the cell. But this definitive ovum is the thing that we care about. So now look, this definitive ovum is gonna come over here now. So let's actually draw this definitive ovum here. And this is the pronucleus of the definitive ovum. And again, he has 23 chromosomes, but this is going to be the female gamete. Look what's gonna happen. They're going to fuse. And when the male pronucleus fuses with the female pronucleus, now look. This is going to fuse. This is going to fuse. And look what you get. You're actually going to form your zygote. You finally form the beginning point of the embryo. Okay? Conception has occurred. And so now look what happens. Now we formed our zygote, our 2N, and this is going to be the zygote. All right, Ninja Nerds. Beautiful thing here. I hope it all made sense. I really hope it helped. All right, Ninja Nerds, until next time.